welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. This is Lucas Huber, joined as always by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm good. I am cheerful and bubbly and effervescent and really tired. So I only the first things that I said are a facade right now. <laughs> <laughs> and also by Chris Begay. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm feeling a little less lonely today. A little less lonely. Because I don't know if people know this, but um, I record in my closet because it's the best place in my house where you can't hear dogs barking and, and kids yelling in the background and, and all my clothes and my wife's clothes kind of dampen the sound. And usually everyone else records from other place. But today, Lucas, you're in the closet as well. This I, this is the first time recording from a new apartment I'm living in in Pittsburgh. And um, I got to say, the, the high ceilings are aesthetically pleasing, but acoustically not as much as you would hope. So well, I, I will be a closet podcaster from now yes. on. Yes. Welcome to the closet cub, Rachel. I know. Come on. I need to clear out some space in my very well organized closet so that I can I can record in there next that, week. That sounded mildly not true about the very well organized. <laughs> hey, I'm super organized. <laughs> Well, folks, we're recording at the end of a long week on a Friday evening, and I think we're all a little bit giddy at the moment. So um, bear with us. I think this will be a lot of fun. Um, but I'm actually really excited to hear about the interview that you did this week, Chris. Yeah, so today you're going to hear an interview with uh, Tabby jones Wobler, and she is someone that I've known for a long time. She is someone who works in AAC. So she came over to my house. We sat at the kitchen table and we started chatting about this thing that she put together. Uh, it's a mnemonic and a whole training protocol for communication partners called Master Pal. And part of that conversation that we talk about is how did she develop it? Like, how did she come up with a mnemonic? And she was saying that she went to a conference and uh, it just kind of gelled with her. Like she came back to her hotel room and she's just like, this needs to exist. And she started writing things down. And, and before long, this whole training came kind of spilling out of her onto this piece of paper that she then started putting together. And of course, it took a long time to put it together. But the, the inspiration came at this conference. And that just got us kind of talking and thinking about when did she develop this thing like this, the thing that you're going to hear about this whole training protocol that, that she develops takes hours and hours to develop. And, you know, she did it mostly after hours as a labor of love that she didn't really get paid for, or in a, in a sense, did she get paid for it? Because she's a salaried employee. And so as a salaried employee, you're kind of always working, but you only get paid for a certain hour. And it just got me really thinking about how much time as speech therapists or really educators in general, do we donate because we are passionate about what we, this thing just needs to exist. So I'm going to create it on my own time. You know, I don't know. What do you think? Do, do, do you spend a lot of time doing that? Do you know people who spend a lot of time? Should we be spending a lot of time? You've got the questions kind of rattling around in my brain a little I think it's really interesting that you use the phrase donate time um, because time is so valuable, right? And I feel like the older that I get, the more I realize that. And I constantly am asking myself the same question. Um, you know, I, I'm really passionate about, you know, AAC and autism and I'm constantly creating things. But then sometimes I think, you know, I, I can't, I can't give everything, right? I mean, at some point it becomes, um, you know, it, it, it can start as a labor of love, but then eventually, you know, you need to get paid. Um, and, and it's hard, it's harder. I think when you're in private practice, because you know, that's all you have. Uh, when I used to work in the schools, I at least had that salary to fall back on. So, so it's a, it's a tough question. And I think that a lot of times because we're, we're in a giving industry, we, we love to give. And so I, I find myself over giving. Um, I'm always saying yes. And I'm always trying to help, you know, that parent or that teacher by kind of going the extra mile. And I it just happened last night. I was in my office until 630 and my office hours close at six. And I was just, you know, sharing resources. And I think we need to balance it because I think that we can kind of get burnout really quickly. I don't know. What do you think, Lucas? I know, you know, you're in private practice too. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a I'm a serial uh, overstarter of things for sure, uh, no doubt about that. But part of that for me is I don't I don't really have an off button in terms of the way that I think about the world and interpret it and everything. Like, there's not a work Lucas and a home Lucas. Like, I am always sort of thinking about and processing the same stuff. And it may not help that my you know my wife has a master's in linguistics, right? So the language piece never goes away. We're always there's always that. But the, I think the danger, and this is something that's definitely happened to me. I don't want to 
discourage people from from donating their time if that's something that they are enriched by, right? Like I very much enjoy the things that I do extra, you know, like like podcasts, for example, or you know, a variety of other things. But I have personally experienced also going too far with that and then getting burned out, right? And the, and the last thing I want is to take a you know a, a somebody who's contributing to the community and then sort of use them up, right? Well, I, I thought it was interesting in in the Asha leader that just came out. There was an article and I think the title was social media is different for professionals. And mm-hmm. um, I've seen that get, get posted around in a few places. And, and my first thought was like, yeah, Facebook has become work. Like it really has, like even the ads on Facebook are for like insurance billing systems for me. Like that's, that's how deep it is in the rabbit hole. And um, d- there is a, there are times when I sort of mourn that, you know, that I can't like post my ridiculous you know, terrible jokes it's quite so much anymore and that sort of thing. But it also is such a powerful tool for outreach that I, like, I don't mind spending my time that way, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, not that I would encourage those of you listening to follow up in my stead because <laughs> it's a good 12 or 14 hours a day for sure. You know, that's so interesting you mentioned Facebook because once upon a time when I first started on social media, I did have a very clear divide. Uh, Twitter was my professional place and Facebook was where my mom could go and see pictures of the kids, you know? And now whenever I see notifications on Facebook, it's all from uh, advocacy groups or other professional development groups that I'm part of. Not all, you know, I mean, obviously I still see my brother post something or what, you know what I mean? That's there too. Um, but it's not such a clear divide anymore. Well, I think that social media has kind of infiltrated our lives, right? And like, it, it, I, I couldn't agree more. It used to be like, Facebook was private and it was kind of my private space to connect with my family and my friends. And now it is it is a really useful resource though. Um, and I was at a, a um, mastermind for entrepreneurs. I have like a, a monthly meeting with them and um, we had a new person join and they were kind of talking about how they hated Facebook and they didn't want to start a Facebook. And I was like, I can't tell you how many connections I've made with people who I would have never met through Facebook. Um, and so it's just, it's such a powerful tool. Uh, and I think part of the reason is because people get to see your life. They kind of get a, a insight into your life. So you kind of feel like, you know, somebody, um, you know, we, we talk, just talked to Rachel Langley and I've never met her in person, but I'm friends with her on Facebook and I feel like I know her really well. Um, so it's just so interesting how we have these, these tools now that can connect us so intimately. Yep. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I just started a, a new job and, um, walking through the halls, I saw a, a bunch of people that I'd never met that I had that were friends on Facebook with me, which is bizarre, like four in a row, like really. Um, but I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's tough, right? Because there are absolutely things about Facebook that I'm not happy with in a, in a variety of ways, but it is, it's almost, you know, inescapable and it's such a professional tool. And, and particularly in our field where there's so many underserved folks, it often feels like the only way to reach, um, you know, certain families. Right. Well, I, I, I'm curious though, Rachel. So you mentioned that you went to this mastermind piece that you do once a month. What Mm -hmm. value do you get out of that? I love it, honestly, because it's all people who are not in my industry. So I think, first of all, being an entrepreneur is really isolating, Um, you know, because you you're not usually go. I mean, I'm not going into an office with a huge team. Um, I have a few people that work for me, which is wonderful. And I can bounce ideas off of them. But it's really nice kind of sounding board to come with an idea or a struggle and ask the group, like, what do you think? Um, you know, and, and it changes every month. Every time I go, I have something different that I'm kind of pondering or wondering about. And I think it's just really nice to have feedback. It's like anything else when you're, you're so kind of in the thick of it, you can't step outside of your own business or your own plan or your own project to kind of see big picture. And also just seeing how other people perceive that who aren't, you know, speech therapists. And I'm in the process of creating an online course for autism parents. And I don't really want, you know, people who are in that space. I need people who, you know, could just be parents that just have a child who was just diagnosed with autism. Um, So it's really valuable feedback. Um, That's the the biggest benefit for me. 
I just was thinking about the ways that we all spend our time, right? And and the value that you, that you get out of that is, I mean, that's that's the sort of group that it wouldn't really occur to me to join. But what you just described in terms of the feedback, I think is fantastic. And, you know, we often talk about how SLPs are, are isolates, right? Into them, you know, like if you're working in the schools, you're the only SLP in the building or maybe the three buildings or whatever. But we've sort of created this like archipelago online, right? Like we're, you know, it's like I'm, I'm alone all day and then I'm in the echo chamber all night. You know, I'm surrounded by other SLPs. And, and I, I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but it's something that we should definitely think about, right? Um, how to involve other stakeholders. And one of the best things that I did, so I moved here from Pennsylvania about four years ago. And one of the best things I ever did when I moved here was went on Facebook and searched for Los Angeles-based speech therapists. And there was no group. And I thought, hmm, I was like, well, maybe I should start one. So I started a group. We now have like 200 people who have joined and we host a, um, a quarterly brunch where I just send an invite out and we have, you know, kind of a potluck and what an invaluable way, an easy way to just connect with people in your own, your, your own city. Um, I didn't know anybody when I first moved here and I've met so many people, um, just from a simple act of, you know, starting a Facebook group and, when people have questions, they'll post in, in the group or referrals. It's a really great referral source. Um, so it's just it, that connection piece because I found the same thing. I was so isolated when I moved here. It was just me, myself, and I starting to practice. And I, I didn't have that, the connections and the network that I had when I was on the East Coast. So it's, it's funny how something simple like that um, can really just make you feel so connected um, and, and connect you to the people that are kind of doing similar things to you. You. you know, uh, Rachel, when you mentioned um, how you go to the, what did you call it? Mastermind? Group? Mastermind. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds like an evil villain. That does. You know, like, yeah, right yeah, the volcano there. <laughs> 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 uh, well, you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. And, and you said how um, you reach out to these other disciplines. That reminds me of uh, once upon a time, I got to do this TEDx talk. And the day before the TEDx, I got to have lunch with the superintendent for our school district and the assistant superintendent at the time. And it was a big deal. Like, I don't get to have... Look, we have a big, fancy pants. Whoa. Exactly. Right? Right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm meeting with the superintendent. Like, uh, it, it was a big... So anyway, I'm sitting down with them and I'm like, this is my chance. I'm going to pitch Twitter to them because these are like old school people. Twitter, this is, we're talking a handful of years ago now. So Twitter was still like in the mindset of education. Most people weren't using it. And I started telling the assistant superintendent about how, yeah, there's this, it's this great thing because you connect people together and you can learn from each other and you can break out of your, your, um, uh, just learning from the people in your immediate sphere. And she said, well, give me an example. What do you, what's something you follow? And I said, well, I, I follow this hashtag called eduwin. So it's hashtag E D U W I N. And I said, what that is, is just educators sharing their their little moments of 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 awesome experiences their their edgy win for the day you know today was the win i had and she said sounds like a lot of people sitting around congratulating themselves and patting each other on the back and, and at first i was like you just crushed this thing that i love like reading about and on the other hand i was like she's so right right like if, if i just constantly watch that hashtag and just participate with that group of people i am knowingly keeping myself in this little bubble and what you're doing by going to that mastermind group is you're saying no i need to learn from other disciplines other than speech and other than education other than teachers i'm going to learn from these other people and that's something I, I know i need to challenge myself to do even more yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm thinking about the last brunch that we had, this SLP brunch. And when do you get a chance to sit with, you know, 20 other SLPs and just kind of talk? And I think that that is so valuable, you know, because everyone has a different perspective. We bring one topic up and then somebody mentions a training that I'd never heard of. And it just kind of, it's it's so important, um, you know, just the same way as CEUs and, and courses and professional development is important. I think it's really important to talk to other SLPs, um, you know, and, and that's where I think social media is really nice because you're able to connect with SLPs all over the country and see what they're doing, um, comment on it. Um, but I definitely think there's something to be said for face-to-face -face and, and the real thing, especially if you're in a school district where you might not ever see another SLP um, except for staff meetings and, and things like that. 
now that I'm thinking about it, actually, I, I think I've always been a connector because at, <laughs> when I was working in the school district, I did the same thing. I was like, let's all get together and have a resource day where we bring all our resources. <laughs> that does not there. surprise me. Um, so now it, it's probably my personality, but I, it's just such a great thing. And it's, it's really not, doesn't take that much additional effort. Um, we kind of started this talk talking about donation of time. And I think that one way we don't have to donate so much of our time is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't need right. to make you know, 100%. all these brand new materials that somebody else has already made for us. Uh, we just need the insight and the connections to figure out what's out there um, and how we can use it to be more efficient. I think. Absolutely. Well, that's, I was going to say, so, you know, the, the way that we sort of started talking about social media, which I think is actually kind of funny because the, the context of this was about ways that we spend our time when we're not working. And like, yeah, that's a lot of it for sure. Mm. And it, you know, again, it feels like work, but um, we, you know, we, we, the, the real context, you know, going back to Chris's interview is, uh, is this the materials generation piece, right? Or a curriculum generation. And um I, I think that there's there's some obvious I, I, okay so th there can be financial benefits right if you're whether that's teacher pay teacher or you're publishing or whatever that might be um, but then there's this also I guess what I would call intangible right and and the first one I would say is is what you just described just in terms of time saving right so you already have these things built and I for one hate not reusing things once I've built something that works like I would love to just replicate that um, but uh, you know a second intangible too is is and I think you you, you alluded to this Chris but is career growth, right? So like, I don't think that I would be where I am today as an SLP if I hadn't put myself out there for years. And so it partially can just be visibility, you know? Um, but I, I guess my point is that there, there are benefits to it, you know, not to mention the maybe final and most important one, which is just, uh, you know, personal enrichment and, and the fact that you maybe enjoy doing it, right? And something else that I always think about too is when you kind of go just a little bit above and beyond for a family, it, it solidifies your relationship. It, I, and, and I'm constantly trying to find ways to build rapport with parents and teachers. And if you just do a little bit extra, it's, it's marginal, the amount of effort and the difference. But if you just do a little bit more, it's, it's amazing the, the benefits that you reap as far as building trust and having a family really kind of buy into your vision. And um, so I, I, I will say that I've noticed just kind of taking that extra step is really beneficial um, you know, for both people. I like that last point the most. I mean, when you go to bed at night, do you go, yeah, I did it. You're like, today I feel awesome about what I did. And that you can't really put a price tag on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then being excited to wake up the next day and head in and see, you know, what, what the results are. I mean, that's, you're absolutely right. That's one reason why I've never gotten tired of, of this profession. Because even when I feel like I, I wasn't successful, you know, I'm still excited to go in and, and figure out why. You know, what's really interesting is actually I have a colleague who is an SLP who I met through my Facebook group, actually. Hey and she is creating a course for SLPs to prevent burnout. So she does a lot of stuff with mindfulness and meditation. And I had a conversation with her and I was really interested and curious about how she came up with this idea. And she was like, I was on the verge of burnout. We're in a giving profession. We give so much all day long. We really need to remind ourselves to take a second for ourselves, take a deep breath. Um, I, I think that self-care is really important. And I think most SLPs, they get into the work that we do because they are givers, because they like to help. But we have to remember to take care of ourselves and you know, establish routines like meditation or going for a run or you know, for everybody it's different, but having those routines in place so that we can really bring our best self to the table when we're coming to work. Because um, burnout, you know, it's not good for anybody. We can't be effective SLPs if we're burnout. I like how I, everyone always references like meditation and running for those things. What about like just watching garbage television or like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, individual differences. Exactly. I mean, come on, we all relax differently, right? I feel like this has been, um, a, you know, a good conversation. I think we hit on a, a couple of different things. First of all, the you know the power of social media in a variety of ways, which can't be underestimated. I think, um, for better or for worse. And then also this theme that it, it can be good to give, right? But not to give all of yourself. And um, I think that's a, a message that we all you know need to hear from time to time. Certainly, I needed to hear it today, honestly. So. 
I appreciate it. Um, for those of you out there who are the overachiever types, we do have a little bit of an announcement actually this week in that we have merged uh, with an organization called Exceptional Ed. And one of the things that we're able to do now, if you are so inclined to share your message, is to facilitate that by providing a, an avenue where you could um, could share, provide CEUs, that sort of thing. So contact us if you're interested, tech at speechscience.org. But without further ado, let's listen to Chris's interview with Tabby jones Woodler. Well, welcome to Talking With Tech. Uh, I'm here with Tabby jones Wallaber. So let's tell the story how we met, because I think that is so much fun, don't you? I, it's actually very memorable, um, because it's the only time in my life I've ever met somebody who did what I do outside of a professional environment. So <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but um, we struck up a conversation, and I recall that you were like, wait a minute, I've got something, and you ran out to the car, and you came back with a stack of your tip -a day calendars. <laughs> yeah, carry those in the, in the trunk all the time just in case. But Yeah, and uh, I got back, and I handed them out to everybody at work, and they're like, what is this? Where did it come from? And I'm like, you're never going to believe. <laughs> I think it's such a good story to tell because uh, how often do we not? strike up a conversation, you know, and then who do you Absolutely. not meet because you're not having that conversation? And because we did, now we're like friends, you yeah. know, and we, yeah. uh, our paths have crossed so many times. Yeah. How many <laughs> conferences and uh, it's just, it's been a great, you know, I agree. Uh, and uh, so now what do you do or what have you done and what are you going to do? Cause I know you're in the middle of a transition, right? Um, kind of. Yeah. I work for Frederick County public schools in Maryland. Like I said, I am an, um, assistive technology, I'm on the ACT team, so the assistive technology team, and um, I work a lot with AAC, so that's really where my passion lies. Um, I do, um, of course, I support the reading, the writing, the access, the whole gamut of assistive technology needs in the public school setting. So yeah, I'm very passionate about it, but AAC is definitely where my heart lies. And So tell me more about AAC. What's that journey looked like when you, when you first started on, on the ACT team? You know, what's it like? Well, my graduate program was at Penn State, and I was on the Augmentative Communication Personnel Training Grant. So from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to specialize in AAC. I worked at um, residential summer camps for individuals with disabilities. I encountered individuals who used AAC. It's really what made me decide to pursue speech pathology. Wow, that's you, that's a kind of unique story, because usually it's the other way around, right? Like, so you want to be a speech therapist, and then, oh, I have to do this AAC <laughs> that's thing? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but you were like, I have a passion for AAC, and then, hey, I should be a, a speech therapist. Is that fantastic? Yeah. yeah. So I, this is kind of always where I started. And, it, you know, I was in a pretty typical elementary school setting for, a, for you know, a period of years as I, as I worked toward it. Um, but I did work for a few years at Rock Creek School, which is a, um, you know, a public school, day school for individuals with disabilities, where most of the kids use AAC in one form or another. Um, so I was on that team for a few years, and they, the, the ACT team is housed at that school. So for a little while, I did half-time, I had a half-time speech caseload and a half-time ACT caseload. Which means two full time jobs. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I did that for a while too, and yeah, I know it's exactly. It's really hard about it, so as quickly as I could, I um, I went full time on the ACT team, and so I have, I have 15 schools that I support. We have several team leaders on our team, and we divide up the schools throughout the county. Um, so I have 15 schools that I support, including Rock Creek, which is where I started, <laughs> right in Frederick County. So do you find, so now your role is to coach other people in the selection and implementation of AAC? How does that work exactly? Yeah. Um, so when the uh, referral gets submitted, I work with students to figure out a good fit for a tool, and we recommend and provide the tool, and then we provide training and coaching as needed to implement the tool. We do countywide professional development. Rock Creek, I have a lot of liberties. The administration there is super supportive, so I come up with crazy harebrained ideas about ways to implement AAC and coach staff more effectively, and they're like, you bet, let's do it. <laughs> so I have a lot of support there to try different things, um, which is been awesome. Uh -huh. So what are some of those crazy hair rain screens? Um, well, one of the things that we did is we created the classroom core book, and I presented at this at Closing the Gap and at ATIA, but the classroom core book is essentially a big binder of core vocabulary, and it's organized by parts of speech with color-coded pages, and it is a low-tech tool to help teachers identify the vocabulary that's used in a lesson and have that vocabulary readily accessible. So it's a teaching tool. It's not a device or anything, but it helps staff to 
really highlight the vocabulary that's being targeted. One of the biggest benefits of it is the pre-planning. So teachers have to think about what they're going to say and how they're going to say it, which makes them use vocabulary more effectively. The other thing that it really helped is it makes the vocabulary visual to everybody in the room. So all of the instructional staff in the room now know what to model on a child's device because it's visually present in the environment. It's been amazing because teachers literally just flip the pages, pull the vocabulary, and it's pretty much at their fingertips. It has, there's about 300 words in the classroom core book. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Um, that was a very large undertaking. <laughs> Did you say you have it uh, organized by colors? Too, today. By um, the Fitzgerald key. Gotcha. I don't want to make an assumption that people know what the Fitzgerald key is. So, so the Fitzgerald key is a color coding scheme used on AAC devices. So your pronouns are yellow, your verbs are green, your adjectives are blue, et cetera, et cetera. So we use color coded paper. The symbols themselves are color coded, the removable symbols, but the pages that they're stored on are color coded so that you can look from the edge, like I need my adjectives, and you can just flip to the blue section. Gotcha. And so with the idea is that the teachers use this as a planning tool, right? right? And so when they're planning, they might say, okay, what are the target words? So we've got to go to the adjective page and then here are other things that we can mm -hmm. use or say, mm -hmm. right? So people could replicate this and make oh, it. Oh yeah. It's available. Let's see. I did post on practical AAC, but then I updated it and all the updated templates are on Teachers Pay Teachers. My store is communication actualized and actualized is AAC actualized. Awesome. Awesome. We'll make sure we have that. Linked. We'll make sure yeah. you have a link in the show. Um, so all the templates are on there. They're free to download. Uh, so that's one tool. That's one. Um, another thing that we did was called core collaboration. And then what happened was once we put these core books out there, everybody in the school got one, every teacher, every SLP. And it was cool, but initially there was a little bit of a struggle to figure out how do I use this? Like, what purpose does it serve? How do I incorporate it? You know, implementing AAC has such a large learning curve for everybody. <laughs> we set up core collaboration, and I've also presented at this at AT on this at ATIA, and it is um, it was a four part training model. So the first thing that happened was teachers signed up for whatever they wanted to do. There was no mandate; it was completely voluntary. But I I put up sign up sheets, and people signed up for an observation as the first step, and the observation was literally me just coming in and observing who's in your class, what tools do they use, how do they use it, what does the structure of the classroom look like. It was just information gathering on my part. Um, the second session was a planning session where we planned together and so teachers brought to me whatever lesson they wanted to, to work on and they could decide what role they wanted me to play. So I would take over teaching the lesson, I would co-teach the lesson, I would be the videographer, I would play the role of an instructional assistant. So they got to choose what role they wanted me to play but we planned it together with an emphasis on modeling, core vocabulary, creating communication opportunities. Um, and then we talked together. And when we did that, we, we solicited somebody's help to video the lesson. And then um, afterwards, I broke down the video, tried to edit it down to really capture the essence of the, of the best parts of the instruction. And then the fourth session, the fourth slot that they signed up for was a reflect and review, where we would review the video, talk about what worked, talk about what didn't. But what was awesome about this is it really, you know, at this particular school, we have monthly trainings. A lot of it is focused on community communication. So they are constantly getting information related to communication. The real need was how does it work in my classroom? Like right. I get what you're saying, but how does it work with my kids, with my content? So that was the goal, was to make that connection. But again, nobody required it. It was completely voluntary. And with the exception of one teacher, every person came back for more. You know, I kind of liken it to this idea that top athletes, like they don't train for an hour a day like you or I might work out mm -hmm. or half hour a day. Like yeah. they, get, they put in hours and hours of training and they do it all the time. And I think that teachers, once they really get the basic information about AAC and what it is and why we use it and how to implement it, in order to be really effective, they need that coaching and they need those teachers that are more in the know need more because they're at that place where in order to really um, become experts and really thrive with it like they need the community they need the back and forth they need the exchange of ideas so that's kind of what I've learned through that process but it's been a great being at um, the support that I get at that particular at Rock Creek has been awesome for you know even coming to that discovery on my own. That is um, something we talk about a lot on this podcast is the moving from uh, theory to practice and how do you actually make it practical and real? And then I, so I think that's what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, that sounds great to me. I mean, that sounds great what you're pitching, but how does it really pertain to what I do in the classroom? What it sounds like you did is you actually brought it to uh, something real for them and made it ongoing, right? I mean, yeah. I think that's something. That, that's, that yes. we fall short of is like, here, let me do some initial grade training 
and then good luck, you know, but it's got to be this sustained training yeah. and then people come back. Right? Yeah. And that's actually what model is a master pal is sort of the continuation of how to keep it an ongoing conversation where people are continuing to gain skills and gain information and become more proficient and more informed about what it actually looks like for us. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. You brought okay. it up. What is a uh, model as a master pal? So, <laughs> model as a master pal um, is a brainstorm that has evolved. Um, and it is also very exciting. A couple years ago, I went to ATIA and I went to Closing the Gap and then I went back to ATN and it was these, you know, pretty big conferences kind of all stacked in a row. And I was sitting in my hotel room one night looking through some of my notes and thinking the same things keep coming up for me. They're like, well, of course, but there's still an element of, oh, this is so important. Uh -huh. This has to happen. <laughs> so what it really got down to was like the the behaviors and belief systems of communication partners. So once we introduce core vocabulary, people don't really dispute it. Yeah. You know, they it makes it. such good sense. Yeah. There's research to support it. You, there's lots of evidence once you start really having the conversation. And then you start to see a little success. Yeah. 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 So core vocabulary is a, um, Commun creating communication opportunities is another conversation that's always coming up. Like we need opportunities during every part of the day. So, you know, once you kind of get into that conversation, you see that devices are out and, I want to make sure I understand that the creating communication opportunities is how do you structure the environment and how do you structure the actual lessons so that you're getting to the target word that, or target words that you're working on? Yeah, right? kind of. But what I often see is that, yep, he has an opportunity to respond during circle. So what happens is the communication opportunities are created, you know, in, in theory, but they often result in interactions that are um, characterized by compliance or responding. Yeah, so there's I've asked a you a question, and I'm, I'm asking you to correct. answer that correct. question. And, so and, and that's what all the communication opportunities look like all day long. So we've, you know, like those are two important conversations to have, but it really still doesn't get to the heart of what does it mean to be a, a communication partner that is engaging on a really natural and engaging level. Mm -hmm. So model is a master pal is an acronym. And um, so master pal is, are the letters of the acronym. So it goes like this, M for motivate. A, accept multiple modalities. S, statements more than questions. T, time, wait time, and time for language development. E, engage naturally. R, response not required. P, presume competence. A, appropriate prompting. And L, let the child lead. Those are all things that when you hear them, you're like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, when you and I hear them, we said, because we've been doing it so long, but when a brand new communication partner uh, who's new to this or has even been, maybe they're not new to it, and it's a nice way of breaking it down so that it's a mnemonic that they can re practice and remember, yeah, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So these are, the, these are the things that I felt like kept coming up on social media and at conferences. These were the, these, I, these ideas were so valued, and yet w in practice, we know that they're underutilized. So I put together some training modules, and I first did it um, with a preschool environment. Yeah, and who are your guinea pigs? Yeah, so um, there, was a, there were several families in this uh, that had kids in this preschool who were really interested in, in this conversation related to AAC. So it was a preschool where there were seven kids. Six of the seven um, students with IEPs had an AAC device. Wow, okay. So, yeah, so um, it was a pretty intensive environment. So we opened this up to the staff and the families. The administration worked with us to make sure all the staff could attend. We did it. We did it. Tw I did it twice, back to back, so that half the staff could come. So, real, real quick question: yeah. the devices that they were using, different systems, they or were different pretty, systems? Yeah, okay. Um, they were different systems for a variety of reasons. They had come to this, and some of them came with their own, and others had more vision and motor issues that limited access. So there was. You had administrative support, which seems absolutely. to be huge. Right? It's impossible without. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, what was the training like? The training we did it over a series. I think we did four or five trainings over the. We did on every two to three weeks over the course of a, um, about a half a school year. So half the staff would come um, to the first session and the other half would come to the second. First up, uh, families were invited. We kept it fairly casual. So we had, we always started off with a conversation. Like, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about it? And how does that pertain to me? And then we would go through and talk about some of the social science related to it, what it looks like with AAC and, um, and, and have that conversation. But there was such good feedback and the conversations were really rich. 
because it provides a framework for, for discussion. And I think that that's one of the most important things. So, so it's more of an interactive discussion than like you give talking points, you have make a few yeah. points and then like, what do you think? Let's talk about it. How does it actually, Yeah. so much better training, <laughs> right? I mean, for, again, not just specific to AAC, any training is like that, right? Who wants to be sitting and lecture? So know? true. When you say staff attend, you said families and staff, does that mean the paraprofessionals as well or mm -hmm. just teachers or and gotcha? Everybody's invited. The first time it was just a conversation and I realized that wasn't going to work. The second time we did it with staff and families. The third time we did it, we did it during two-hour early dismissals. So we targeted those times because the instructional assistants, paraprofessionals are available during those times. The idea is that this is really appropriate for any audience. It's really about having that conversation. You really want the people who are there with the students the most anyway, you know, right? I mean, the speech therapist yes. is more of a, I think, moving into a, a coaching role in the first place. So um, it would be better if they were there so they could also <laughs> continue on coaching. But yeah. if not, at least you have the people that are going to be working with the kids directly, right, yeah. and the families, which is yeah. huge. So I think and, that gets left off. Yeah, and moving forward, we're, um, we're looking at setting it up for next year as maybe a, um, a four-credit course or at least a course that SLPs can get CEUs for. So it'll be, again, an ongoing series. Huge. So that people can continue to have this conversation. You know, when I get the call or the email that says the device just isn't working, my question is usually has nothing to do with the child or the device. It's how is it being implemented? Yeah. What are you doing? What the staff doing? What does, like, let's look at the environment and exactly. let's look at the interactions of the people. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that's really where it lies. And inevitably, if I go in and work with a child using their device, you know, attending to some of these behaviors and, and I hold these mindsets, it looks different. So I leave and I'm like, wow, that was really, he doesn't usually do that. That's not how it usually, this was a really good day. Right. And I'm like, well, I think this is where we need to be looking. It's a really good day because I follow these principles. <laughs> and if you follow these principles, you'll have many more good days. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So Pretty let's, much. let's talk about them again because we went over them really quickly. Okay. You, um, you, you, you opened up to the, the your, you have a book, first of all, right? And you yeah. also have a digital. So yep. let's so talk about a, that. Okay, so there's a digital folder um, that has everything in it. There's a start here folder <laughs> that gives you instructions. Um, and the start here folder also has all of the modules laid out with all of the links to all of the resources for that module and about how much time each module will take if you follow it per the way that it's laid out. But of course, you can take bits and pieces of it and use whatever is useful to you. So for instance, there's a, a module on prompting and I did that and one on wait time, and I did those as standalones at a school where two SLPs had identified. This is a real area of need. Can we have, can we talk about this? I didn't do the whole series, so, yeah. you know, like it doesn't have to be all together. So there's a digital folder, and the digital folder has start here documents, but then inside that there are folders for, that have the Google Slides, um, the handouts for participants, because some of the inter act, inter activities are interactive, so you don't want to give it away yeah. in the handout. And then there's a facilitator handout. So the facilitator handout, and it lays out what the, just the talking points are for each slide, as well as instructions on any of the interactive activities. That is fantastic because it means you don't have to do it. Like so you, someone else can be yeah. a facilitator. Oh, it's really yeah, meant yeah. to be replicated. It's really, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that was the whole purpose, actually. So it started off as my brainstorm, and then I used it, and then I thought, this conversation needs to be happening in more places than I can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we shared it at um, MATN. Maryland Assistive Technology Network for their Spring Institute. Um, we shared this. We did a one-hour overview and gave the, the links to pass off to that. I bet you people loved it. They did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also in the facilitator handout, there's links to supplemental handouts. There's video links if, to extend the conversation. Um, there's instructions for interactive activities. And then there's a whole list of extension resources. I mean, I did not create all of these things, but there's so much out there. And I think one of the challenges of providing effective AAC support is how do we culminate? How do we bring together all the resources in such a way that people can, you know, and it's an ongoing task. It'll never be done. But there's an attempt at bringing together things relevant to each module um, at, the end of the, at the end of the facilitator handout. So Yeah, it, that what you've developed is like a college course. I mean, it's a, it's just step one through and you just take, it's like a syllabus that you yeah. have with all the resources that anyone could plug in. Yeah. So let's talk about Master really Pals again. When you first told me about it, immediately I thought, well, okay, th this is just an acronym mm -hmm. to, to remember the good practices that we need to be using. So how, you, do you start with M and you just go right through M-A-S-T and that's how you do your, your training? That's how I've done it so far. But like I said, I've also taken pieces of it and given them, given them on an individual basis. Gotcha. Um, AUC is not intuitive. 
It, it follows natural language development, a progression, so it's predictable in that sense. And you know, we all have opportunities to interact with kids and watch their language development, but we're kind of uh, not aware necessarily of our role in that, how we repeat, recast, extend utterances, offer those natural consequences we don't have an, we don't a lot of times we don't have an awareness about that that we can carry over yeah so it is natural but it's not intuitive yeah. so i feel like being explicit helps people to really understand the whole child the whole picture the whole scope of what we're trying to accomplish Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It just, yeah, it just seems like magic that it happens, but it's not really that. And so you have to really break down into these little components and be like, here's what's actually happening. Yeah. yeah. I love that word, explicit. All right, so, so M is for motivate. Okay, so M is for motivate. And motivate really gets at the idea that none of us do anything without motivation behind it. So there, there has to be a reason. There has to be a purpose. Motivation is intrinsic. It can be intrinsic which is like the self-satisfaction piece. It can be extrinsic, which is the reward that you get, the paycheck. Uh, the carrot. <laughs> the carrot. Yeah. Um, but I also think that there's an element of motivation that comes from readiness, like having, uh, you know, when kids, our kids who use AAC, a lot of times the world happens around them and they don't have a lot of influence on it. Mm -hmm. So when we take their environment and we make it more structured, we provide visual supports, we let them know what's happening and we interact with them on that level, we are providing um, a readiness for learning that can also play into the, the purpose and the motive, you know, which relates to motivation. So, um, so this section really talks about the fact that kids, um, they need to have purpose behind what they're doing and balloons and uh, gummies and, you know, like that is not motivation, <laughs> right. it's a reinforcer, but they're not the same thing. All right, what's the A okay. sample? So A is for accept multiple modalities. And this one is, um, I think, fairly self-explanatory, but we all communicate for lots of purposes and lots of reasons. We all use text and email and speech and facial expression and body language. We use all of these things. I'm nodding right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it gives us feedback from our communication partners. So understanding that when our kiddos, you know, using AAC is hard. It's, it has to be taught. It has to be modeled. And when things are hard, we have to support whatever they can give us, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make them want to do the hard. Mm -hmm. So always requiring the hard is not necessarily the best way to affect a meaningful interaction. And, and I guess the other side of it, too, is kids that are able to respond verbally, even if they have a device, accepting that and honoring and validating so that they understand how powerful language is, so that we're not undermining the opportunity to teach them that. We can still model on their device when we respond. Exactly. exactly. So it's not a conversation. You find this is a trap people fall into sometimes. Oh, yeah. They'll go say, say, say it, it on your device. device. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> that's uh, S. Okay. S is statements more than questions. Um, this is one of the meteor modules. So this one is probably the longest. There's several interactive activities. But the idea here is that um, responding is not the way that we engage with one another. We ask questions, but then we elaborate, we comment. We do so many things when we are engaging with one another. And statements, if you're always asking a child questions, you are backing yourself into a corner because they only have one way to respond. And if they can't respond that way, then it's hard to keep the conversation. It's also hard to create personal opportunities to model to create the learning that needs to happen. Yeah. So um, Mari Nevers did a webinar with the Angelman Syndrome Communication Training Series. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's an amazing training series. And she has, she did a 30 minute-ish webinar called um, Don't Ask, Do Tell. And it is really powerful. It's really powerful. So that's referenced several times in this module. And there's a couple pieces of it that are highlighted as some great talking points about this conversation. But there's, there's several interactive activities in this module to really help us understand how important the learning is. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, that really comes out in this module is the idea that in order to teach AAC, you have to teach, 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 teach before you can ask a question. Yeah. You have to make those statements, offer those descriptions, give a definition. You have to use that core vocabulary in rich discussion before you can test a child. I think of a story, I was, I was called to help a teacher and she was doing the classic WH questions was her goal and, this, uh, and she said, this is what she was working on. And she's like, so Chris, I, I keep asking these WH questions and he's not answering. He just doesn't know them. And I'm like, that's because you're not teaching him the answers. So it was like, who, who is a fireman or what does a fireman do? And it's like, did you teach him what a fireman does? Because if he doesn't know yep. what a fireman is, then... And even if he does know it, but doesn't know where to get to it, 
you know, if he's using a device or a, so yeah, that adds a whole extra extra yeah, layer. That, Absolutely, but it's it, it run, it, something with teaching is you, you teachers for some reason seem to drift more to asking those questions. I, I think there's even some research, and I've been on a hunt to try and find it because it's one of those things like you read the research, you don't keep it, and then where is that again? Because I need that. I need that. Yeah. Um, where they someone had done done the research where they had. Uh, you know, observe teachers and uh, with students using communication devices, and they found that the number of questions was just way higher than when talking to, you know, speaking students. The thing that I always try to talk to teachers about is teach and believe before you test, and every question is a test, so it comes into I wonder, not to divert mm -hmm. here, but just, and I wonder if it's in your modules or if this is the place where you also talk about it. Um, I can see teachers going, okay, great, I will I will teach, and then I'll ask questions at the end. Like you said, maybe it's a seven to one ratio, seven teaching to one, and then I'll, then I'll ask the question. What I often see in, in classrooms, and I'd be curious if you see the same thing, is that, okay, so you've told me to model on the device, so I'm gonna give a lot of commands on the device, like oh. sit, uh, go, get your thing, you know what I mean? Where it's, yeah. which to me is like- Bossing the kid around, using their talker. Yes, exactly, which makes me think, that's the last thing I'd wanna do is touch that talker if you told me, like, whatever, that communication device, if you're constantly yeah. barking orders at me with it, so. so. Yeah, actually that is not in here, but I've had several conversations in the last probably six months that have made me think, hmm, maybe that's something. <laughs> yeah, that could be it, added. Yeah. All right, so what's I next? Maybe one. The next one is time. Time can be divided up into two separate modules. One talks about language development. The other talks about wait time, because they're both really important. I think it's that is not well understood by a lot of the people in the trenches who were tasked with implementing AAC is what does natural language development look like? Mm -hmm. So, you know, those first words that kids say really are powerful words, and a lot of times they're what we would call French words. It's yeah. like mama, cup, ball, but those are imperative. Mm -hmm. They have to have those words. We can't default to core alone without giving them the things that are really meaningful, but it happens so quickly that those words get enveloped by the core. Yeah. You know, ball, I want it. Yeah, that. I mean, it happens within like six to nine months after kids have their first words. So it happens very quickly, but it, each step along the way is part of the process. Mm -hmm. So understanding that process and understanding what we as communication partners do, how we respond to those early communicative attempts influences the way that language develops. So again, that repeating, reframing, extending, responding naturally to those utterances is how language develops. So I find that breaking that down and again, making it very explicit is a really, really important conversation. Yeah. One of the things that really gets people is when you have the conversation about um, what, you know, the child in your life who says uh, yeah. <laughs> with the perfect intonation of a familiar caregiver. <laughs> right. That really gets people thinking, how did they learn that word? It's not like we taught it to them, but we did because we modeled it. Yes. Yes, intentionally or not, and for whatever reason, it's meaningful. They always use it like with appropriate context and intonation when they do that. So I think that those conversations are really beneficial. Yes, that sticks in people's minds. It mind. sticks. The other part of um, time, obviously, is wait time. So um, for this part of the module, I really I highlight Kate Hearn's umbrella. <laughs> I'm not even it. familiar, but let's describe it for people. Okay, who so are. it's a um, it's a graphic, and it has an umbrella at the top, and that first umbrella is motivate and then it goes through the hierarchy of prompting and between each each level it, there's a little arrow down and it says wait 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 so giving that wait time the expectant pause the expectant look it's in with AAC I and mean, there's so many reasons there's the the need to process there's the need to recruit the motor activity there's the need to visually attend and take in what's being presented before you know a child is going to effectively engage with their their tool. Yeah, I love that you're bringing this part into the to the whole training because it is again one of those things that's sort of invisible, you know. And now, like Kate did with that visual, and what you're doing in the module is bringing it to the forefront, so people have to think about, okay, I'm I'm actually going to wait because otherwise it's too easy to just move on and feel that uncomfortable silence and want mm -hmm. to fill it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that is yeah. So that's talked about in there too. I have a video of a child who is using a switch to turn on uh, music. So highly motivating. And his wait time is 55 seconds. But as he is waiting, he's looking at it. You can see him turning his head. You can tell that he is recruiting the motor coordination and it takes him 55 seconds. But when he finally hits that switch, his arm comes like a flash and just nails it. It's so spontaneous when it does happen, but that wait time is essential. Absolutely, to... and if someone had jumped in, he'd have to start all over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The E is engage naturally, and engage naturally, 
um, there's so much to engage naturally. This this conversation is very, there's lots of different pieces to it. So part of engaging naturally has to do again with that language development piece. So that's touched on. Engaging naturally um, addresses semantics. So some of the, the, the language that we use, like hit the button rather than what do you have to say? Mm -hmm. So is it is it a motor task or is it a communication task? Right. <laughs> um, engage naturally talks about what kinds of communication opportunities are presented. Is it just comment or is it just respond compliance, respond compliance? So how do we move away from that and engage in the learning and in the, the social aspect of, of engaging with one another? There's also a piece of this that talks about how do we build emotional confidence with our students? So there was a really great research article that I read. Um, it was published two years ago, and it's looking at how do we support emotional confidence in the vocabulary we use in AAC devices and the need to not just identify an emotion, because a lot of times that's how emotional confidence goes. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you feel? Yeah. I'm mad. Okay, you're mad. Time to get back to work. Yeah, exactly. Now what? <laughs> but really, it's about how do you feel? What happened? Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then what can we do to make it better? So really engaging the child in that understanding, just as you would your own child or grandchild or niece or nephew, but how do we really honor them as an individual and give them the language to help them process and understand? Love that. So again, it's something that was so, <laughs> the way you built it in is that you built that emotional piece into the concept text of let's just be natural with each other. Just just don't be a jerk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Again, I could talk all day about that. I know. We, we could have a podcast episode on each one of these. We could. <laughs> we definitely could. So response not required um, is actually very closely aligned with the statements more than question piece, I think. Um, so response not required is just the idea that sometimes we need time to take in what's being said to us and we may not have a response. And I think that plays out in our own lives lots of different ways. Sometimes I will be in an interact in a situation where I don't respond and then afterwards I'm like, what I should have said was, yeah. or, um, uh, you know, after I get off a phone call, somebody, you know, gives me information and I'm like, I don't, I'm not really sure what to do with this right now. I'll have to get back to you. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different ways that we can relate to this idea that a response is not required, but ultimately when a child is always expected to respond, the pressure is always on. Okay. But that the pressure is on. I think a strategy here is, um, Descriptive teaching, right? You go sit down yes. next to the student and you just start saying what you're doing without the expectation that they do anything at all. If you have a little baby, you expect them someday to talk, but you still model all the time, like, mm -hmm. and, and you don't even think that you're doing it. I think that that's um, one of the things, and th I haven't experienced this, but one of my teammates, after we shared this, as one of our two-hour early dismissal, somebody, um, one of my teammates came back to me and they were working with a staff member who looked them in the eye after watching them and said, oh, response not required. Like, once they saw it, they, they clicked. It clicked. Totally. <laughs> That's what you mean. Yep. <laughs> and it's, the other thing about that, though, is it's so counterintuitive in an educational environment because responding is inherent in classroom discourse. Totally. So for those in the classroom implementing AAC, it absolutely requires a different way of thinking about how to present information and how to engage a child in that discourse. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay, so P is for presumed confidence. Presuming confidence is a mindset, mm -hmm. and you can't mandate a mindset. Mm -hmm. you ha it has to be shaped. It has to be shaped with information. It has to be shaped with experiences. Who knows what, how we each come to our own mindsets, but it's a culmination of the things that have impacted us. So the idea here is that information is shared, videos are shared, there's several videos in this module that put it out there. The idea that every child who uses AAC is a communicator, is a learner, and is an individual. Can I ask, the statements that, are, that you're displaying, are they negative or someone No, 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 ordered? they're positive. They're positive statements. So, sorry, I didn't finish that thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say, because sometimes where I have done it, I'm looking to grow myself is that I will share the negative. Like, here's something that is not presuming competence. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is what has been said. Do you think that's presuming competence? And you should say no, because it's very <laughs> obvious that, you know, you've tried to limit the student in what you said. It, it sounds like your statements are not that. They're no, these statements are positive statements, and it really gives an opportunity for everyone to, for those, for participants to think about what it means for them with the students that they work with. Um, one of the things that I find with presumed competence is some people love it in theory, but in reality have a hard time sussing out how that plays out in their classroom. Mm -hmm. um, or people who completely misunderstand what it means. So presuming competence means that I think he should be doing eighth grade science when he has clearly demonstrated that he cannot do eighth grade science. Mm -hmm. But what, it, what I understand presumed competence to mean is providing opportunities 
and access to um, learning spaces that are inclusive, that are always provided, always allowing the child to sh to grow. This this is where I start when I do trainings because I want this to be. Um, and I understand it would be Pastor Mal that would have changed it around. But you don't have to start it. <laughs> you know, yeah, you jump around uh, because without this, a lot everything else becomes like, eh, you know, they, they can't do it. I can't. Absolutely true. Uh, a is for appropriate prompting. So uh, the idea here is that prompting goes, you know, you can have a least to most or a most to least. It really depends on where the skill set is. Um, but providing prompting does not replace modeling for the sake of teaching. Um, and hand over hand is really counterproductive mm -hmm. for teaching AAC. So there's discussion about hand under hand and how that is actually achieves the perceived goal of hand over hand. So hand over hand, you know, if you're trying to teach a kiddo a motor plan, you know, if they're resisting, they're not learning it. You know, like the wires aren't firing to, to, to learn that. Yeah. And if, if you are taking control, then they're going to relinquish control. So they're not learning what it either. Learning There's it? nothing firing. You know, what wires, what fires together, wires together. So it's, that's it's not happening. It's passive, yeah. So that's not happening if there's hand over hand prompting. So really trying to hone in on that because I feel like that's something that you see too much of. <laughs> so what's hand under hand? So hand under hand is when you, uh, you, you know, you might model and allow the child to go along for the ride. You know, have their hand on top of yours. You can't see what she's doing, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but with hand under hand, the child can pull away at any time. You're right. not forcing a thing, so they can they can get the idea of that motor plan. What's the pattern? You know, on, gotcha. the, on the display. Your hand is under their hand, and you're mm -hmm. the one who's touching it. But yeah. then they with, can. Yeah. yeah, or with reading, like going the left the left to right. So giving them given the input, but it's of their own volition. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the things that I tried that try becomes emphasized throughout is that autonomy, letting the message be the child's own voice is so important to get at the heart of communication. Yeah. If it's forced, it's compliance. Yeah. And then what good is it? And what good is it? <laughs> it makes, yeah. It's the illusion that you're making progress, but you're not really. Yeah, it is definitely an illusion. And then the last module is let the child lead. And let the child lead um, really talks about how important it is for the child to be in control of their communicative destiny. <laughs> so um, giving the, uh, but observing, listening, watching, and seeing what the child does, and then figuring out how you can enter their world. And I think this is especially relevant to our kiddos who have a lot of behavior problems. So behaviors are often, you know, if we assume that all behavior is communication in some form, it gives us great insight as to what a child desires, dislikes, seeks mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason. So when we get some of our most complicated kids that are, um, that have a lot of stimming behaviors that are, you know, they're just difficult to engage. If we watch them and we observe them and we engage on their level, we imitate them, we look at them eye to eye, we, we follow their lead, then we can figure out how to shape communication opportunities around that. With the Master Pal, how do people get it? How do people see it? Or is there is it in your teacher pay teachers? Or is um, there... it's not in teachers pay teachers yet? Oh, that would be a good place to put it. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of documents. Bitly, b i t dot l y backslash model as a Master Pal training module, and M in model and Master Pal are all capitalized. And we'll have that link so people can go right to our website and they can uh, get that link and get all the materials, right? Yeah. So they can replicate what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. And again, like it's appropriate for all audiences and modify it as you like. Mm -hmm. It's really just meant to be a tool to get these ideas out there so we can have rich and meaningful conversations about how to make AAC implementation more effective. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on Talking With Tech. Thank you for putting this whole thing together and sharing it. I think it's going to be super useful for people. I hope so. I hope so. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, welcome back. That was a fantastic interview. I think that, um, I mean, we have all this research that indicates the importance of peer and partner training in AAC, but not a huge, huge amount of curriculum, right? So, I mean, this is an um, enormously important effort. Well, if you've enjoyed the show, please drop by iTunes and, and give us a rating. I mean, that's uh, partially for, for the warm, fuzzy feelings that you will engender in all three of us, but also because that helps other folks to find us. And really the whole point of this is to, to share the information. So we'd appreciate that. And then track us down on 
Facebook too. Um, we have a, a group and a page talking with tech. Uh, it's it's it can be pretty lively in there. We'd we'd love to answer questions. We we like to answer questions that way because everyone can see them, um, you know, and benefit also from the answer. Uh, but if you if you'd like to contact us privately, you can also reach us at tech at speech science.org. For talking with tech, this has been Lucas Duber, Chris Begay, and Rachel Madel. We'll talk to you all next week.